The Earnestly Speaking Podcast is a show that is founded on free-flowing conversation and may at times venture into mature subjects. Listener discretion is advised. All right, welcome to this Nurse Week Podcast. I'm your host, Ernest Eater, Chris, coming to you. Still quarantine, locked down in South Florida here. Online, of course, uh, old friend of pod, my man, Frank Cremiano. It's been a long time, man. What's up, buddy? Engine cards. Here we go, baby. What's going on? I'm good. Are you, wait, are you, uh, are you on the road right now? I'm on the road. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> should, should we be in the house quarantined? <laughs> <laughs> No, you know what? It, it, it's funny because I have so much energy going on right now that I can't sit still. All this extra, you know, because uh, as I was telling you earlier about, uh, you know, trying to fix my diet and working out a whole lot more. How's that going? Um, my energy level is so high. Like, I just, it's, it's going well. I mean, I can't complain. Um, I've been staying away from my urges. You know, I have my, my addictions to soda and things like that. So oh, I see, brother. I've been so trying to stay away from that and sugar and and uh, so, you know, I'm just trying to make that difference in my life right now. You it's know, so I, I hard. A, I had a couple of scares. Mm-hmm. It's so hard, though, to do I that. I had a couple of situation. scares. That... Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, it's, and it, so it got to the point where I didn't really have a choice anymore. I had to uh, I had to get myself healthy and start doing healthy habits again, like used to in the old days and, you know, work and and uh, financial obligations and family and all that kind of stuff gets you to not focus on yourself. So uh, this it definitely made me to start paying attention to my body a lot more, what I can and what I can't do, and I'm not willing to go backwards anymore. Yeah, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit right now, too, this is now week six for me being locked down since this pandemic started. Um, it's been a challenge for me really in terms of the eating and the, you know, I said, I have the same problem with sodas too. I don't have a lot of vices, to be honest with you, but soda is one, one of my vices that I have a right. hard time getting rid of. I don't drink much. I don't, obviously I don't smoke, but soda is the one thing for years where, and, and it's funny because there was a time what years back where I did go a, a full year without drinking soda and I actually lost like a lot of weight at the time. Just, 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 mm-hmm. just by dropping that alone, not doing anything else. And, yeah. but God, I mean, I mean, for me, it's Coke. Um, that's an addiction. Coke is an addiction. It's like, right. like freaking heroin almost. <laughs> you know, but uh, right. I, I, it, for me, it's a struggle now, but especially too, because I'm always in the house and I'm adhering to the rules of staying in the home and only going out when you need uh-huh. to. The problem is now, then what do you do at the house? I right. mean, yep. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where you have to kind of balance it out. But You I, exercise. Yeah. You exercise. You study. You perfect your craft. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of things that you can do. Yeah, yeah. So you 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 know you you just have to make a point of uh, staying focused on those things, especially right now. You're not stuck in the work grind. You're not stuck having to worry about who's babysitting or you know is the wife home or am I home tonight. It's all of you are there. You're able to focus on whatever it is that mm-hmm. your long term goals are, your short term goals are. Preparation is all in place. You have no excuse to reach every goal that you need to reach oh, because I, of time. I agree, hundred percent. I've been luck, I've been getting down with the podcast, this one, my wrestling podcast, all that. You, however, also you and your wife Laza, um, have started up a a, a greater marriage project on Facebook, which has done pretty well. I'm I'm a part of that as well too. Um, what made you guys want mm-hmm. to do that? Well, so in all honesty, uh, this is something that I started working on a couple of years ago. Um, I, I did, I just didn't have it. It never came to fruition as far as uh, going active, but, uh, we've been married together almost uh, 15 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know, just every marriage has their, their issues, ups and downs, whether it be, um, you know, finance, whether it be family stress, um, mental illness, uh, addiction, whatever it may be all relationships have different issues and I am very fortunate that I happen to have a spouse that has the same, same passion as I do when it comes to working together on our marriage, whether it be health, whether it be an issue with our kids, whether it be, uh, you know, finance, 
you know, whether it, those times that you just, you know, things, you feel like things get boring in life. Um, any of those things, we've come far enough along and we've studied so much. Uh, you know, she's the reader. I'm not really the reader, but I'll, I'll read along with or listen along with. Yeah. Uh, we'll do, we'll listen to podcasts. We'll listen to audio books. What podcast we'll do you guys listen conferences. to? What podcast do you guys listen to together that's uh, uh, been effective to you guys? Well, for for us, for financial purposes, is we listen to Dave Ramsey in Financial Peace University. Love Dave Ramsey. Um, that's been a huge, yeah, that's absolutely been a huge thing because there's nothing like having that mm -hmm. to take the arguing out of your life. Yeah. If you really think about a marriage, what is 90 plus percent of the bickering and the arguments that you have? Financial. It's always in finance. 90% of marriages, it's, I mean, it's been documented um, close to 90% of marriages have to do with financial stress. Mm -hmm. And if the answer really is it has nothing to do with how much you make. It's about what you do together and what you do together to grow for the long term. Right. Um, you know, as I've, you know, as I've counseled other people before, if you were to manage a business, would you hire you or would you fire you yourself? In other words, right. Right. Well, your marriage is a business. I'm not saying to treat it like a business. I'm not saying it's a, it, it's only for a financial gain. What I'm saying is if you're running a business and you want, you know, your boss to think that you're doing a great job, you're going to nurture the business. You're going to make it a priority. You're going to make time for, for the employees, which, which is your family members. You're going to make sure that everything is flowing through the way it needs to go. So now you're being trusted with a business to manage, and that's your marriage. You have to nurture it. You have to steward it. And that includes financial gain. That includes relational uh, parts of the equation. That, that includes all different types of things, different type of personalities and uh, the, you know, the way that we're wired. Uh, it's a very interesting venture that we've uh, been put into, and I feel so lucky that we've been able to take so many different classes um, you know, my wife is actually a certified trainer when it comes to uh, financial training with Dave Ramsey. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's also a big help. Um, you know, I, I have a background in, in, you know, relationship therapy also, you know, working in the churches that I have. Mm -hmm. um, so it all, it all just comes together. And now, now it's really about taking those tools and equipping those that have interest in really improving themselves to get to the point of where they can they can be the same for other people around them, to be that light, to be that example for the people around them. That's just what I'm excited about. It's there's no other reason for it other than just a personal love and goal. Uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, I would say that it's probably the biggest passion I have in my life of all the things I've done is to leave a last a lasting legacy of saving marriage in our culture. And it's funny too because you know with the situation now. I mean, like I said, I'm six weeks into my into my lockdown. You know, the opportunity to start entrepreneurship. You know, whether and through through this medium, whether whether it be what you're doing or what I, what I've been doing for the last couple last ten years. You know, the opportunity now especially has opened up because you have nothing but time, and it's great to see people like yourself really diving in into the roots of what they really are passionate about. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, well, and, and that being said, um, I mean, I, I, we still have our business. We still have work. Mm -hmm. We still have all of the things that um, even if we didn't have this quarantine right now, we would still be working on this. What it did was it fast forward a week or two. Um, you know, that being said, I mean, we're not there's no financial gain out of this. If somehow we get blessed something along the way and, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing some things, writing, uh, you know, that's why it's called the Greater Marriage Project is because I'm trying to put something in place that is more project-based so that whenever you do have an issue in your marriage, along with counseling or along with, uh, you know, experienced people that can help you out, this is something you can work through those little things, little examples mm -hmm. that you can get through a discussion or a right. disagreement or a difference of opinion is the biggest thing. So right. that, that's what my main goal is. We're putting that together. I'm hoping to have that released here within the next year. Okay. Um, you know, I have a couple of prototypes that I'm working on right now, which we'll go over, and I'm sure you'll hear about it at some yeah, point. Yeah, of course. Um, but it, it's 
it, it, it's already working on a lot of couples. I don't want to say it's a foolproof plan because it still takes a certain amount of passion between uh, two individuals to want to work on their relationship. And the biggest thing is to want to work on yourself, right? Mm-hmm. The, the best way to save the relationship is really to work on yourself to become a better person, a better spouse. And while that is happening, your spouse does the same thing. And if, you know, you've been watching our, our, you know, our videos and our live feeds. Yeah, I missed the last one. The I think one on Sunday. Yeah, I think the one on Sunday is the one I missed. Uh, I'm still behind on But I, I've watched mm-hmm. the, the majority of them, yes. So, mm-hmm. yes well, I encourage Sunday. you to check that one out. That one was about humility. Mm-hmm. And what's the opposite of humility is pride. Mm-hmm. And we break down what the differences are in the two and the destruction, the, the t- destructive piece that pride does to a relationship. Right. We were supposed to do this podcast, I think, back in, um, I want to say, mid-February um, to react to uh, Corey Bryant's death. Um, obviously, you're a big Laker fan, especially, too, mm-hmm. so it, it, it definitely means even more. Um, but then scheduling conflicts, the, you know, the memorial wasn't booked until late February, and then by the time everything settled out, we had the pandemic and schedule, comp- you know, all that. So I'm kind of glad we waited to do this now. Um, <clears throat> it's been... About three months now. Wow. I mean, time flies since he passed away. Um, I remember calling you that yeah. day when when the, everything happened within the hour, and we had a it was one of our better conversations we had. I mean, we know each other for 16, 17 years, but that conversation we had, you know, post Kobe when we found out the news. I mean, that was that was tough. <laughs> I gotta be honest, that was tough. Well, I I think we were actually our first phone calls outside of my wife calling me to tell me that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was literally it was probably within two or three minutes of it, the news breaking, and it was funny. The first people that we wanted to call with each other. Yeah. Um, I don't uh, know, but I, it was it was definitely uh, it was definitely uh, a, a shocker. Um, you know, it, it 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 just shows you no matter who you are, there's a there's a uh, mortality that always wins. 100% of the time, and to do with what you can best while you are still here. And, uh, you know, while while I feel like we have lost someone that was doing great things in this world, uh, we were very lucky to have experienced things that he did do and things that he had in place. So, uh, you know, that's a little change of events from the way I was thinking a few months ago. I was thinking about this, too, at the time. Um, I remember you saying this was the biggest, like, Shocking, like sports tragedy, probably ever. And at the time, I was like, well, let's take that. Let's not react in the moment, real quick. But then it's been, then a few weeks went by. I'm like, wait a second. Think about the NBA, especially too. Like all the tragedies in the NBA, every player that's done something. I mean, the only other thing I can remember being tragic like this was the Magic Johnson announced he was HIV positive, and yet he survived that. Of course, right. I mean, so he's still alive. He's still with us. Thank God. Um, and in, and in every yeah. other person that's passed away, you know, that's... A Magic note. Johnson, as we knew him, Magic Johnson, as we knew him, died that day. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And he, he kind of, he, he had a rebirth and became this icon, which, you know, since that time, I feel so, so very blessed that I've been able to meet him and actually speak with him a couple of times. Nice. And he's just a wealth of information. Um... And, and, and I, you know, and that's why he has, you know, the relationships he has in the NBA with the younger players. I mean, he he's a he's a walking book of information, um, and and that's the direction that I saw Kobe doing as well. And a humble, uh, and a humble guy too. Because um, you know, we go ahead. No, like he's a humble guy too. Very, very humble. Like very giving and very, uh, like he's. You know, when you talk about the, the debate about who's the greatest Laker of all time, I, I've always said Magic Johnson. That's not going to change. I mean, that, that hasn't changed. But he's mm-hmm. very much, he's very forthright to say, no, it's Kobe. Um, and I have to like think, like, really, Kobe? Nah. But he's like, he's like, no, it's Kobe. You know? So. Well, same as you. You knew I was always a Magic guy first. Yeah, me too. Um, but yeah. the, the the fact of the matter is, is is Kobe, he had a, long, you know, a bigger business of work. He had... He did not have showtime around him. He did it in separate stints. He didn't have one decade where he had success. He had to reinvent himself multiple times. Mm-hmm. 
his story was just amazing. You know, I, I remember following Kobe since high school, which we've talked about, and just seeing his story, how we, we literally watched him grow up as a man, not just a basketball player. As a husband, we, we you know we knew his dirt, we knew all of his his accolades. We saw every portion of his life, and it wasn't because social media was just being released the way he wanted to be released, but like other greats that we know of. I won't mention any names, LeBron James. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. He control he controls the media that releases any information about himself. He could be the biggest dirt bag when it comes to his family and his wife, and we'll never know about it because he has his everything is controlled. I'm not claiming that he is because as far as I know, LeBron James is a great example of a, of a human being and a, and a, you know, good husband and father. I'm I'm not trying to put that out there. Right. Right. But Kobe Bryant, he was ridiculed so heavily during that period of time where he had all those accusations and he grew through it and he became a greater person at the end of it. Right. So that, that that's, that's one of the areas where I have, a ton of respect. Right. And, and that's also where it hits for me, too. I, I, I said this on the, on the show countless times after he passed away. One of the reasons why I it hurt me about Kobe passing away, because the way I became a fan of his was very natural. Because initially, first five, six years in the league, I didn't care for him. I didn't like him. I thought he was very arrogant. I thought, who was this kid who wants to claim he's the next Jordan and he has done shit? You know, he has done nothing. And then you had Colorado happens, of course, and then, you know, all that. But. The reason why Kobe's death hit me hard is that he was probably, in comparison to Michael Jordan, he was more real to me. Like, when I grew up watching basketball, and you mm-hmm. and you as well, we were around the same age, you know, Michael Jordan was alien. Like, Michael Jordan was so uh, uh, so unreachable in a way, the way, the way he was propped up. Whereas Kobe Bryant, from, from the word go, through Colorado, his marrow issues he had, he felt more real. And then to to be to be completely well, honest with you, his whole story is really a, a redemption story. If you think about it, mm-hmm. he stole. Well, he, be careful he, he, bringing MJ into this because that's an argument we were already having through the week. You know that. Oh, as so, far so, as so, that the, goes so the goat Carmen? MJ was just a different story. Well, MJ. I, far, no, I, I've never argued that part. Mm-hmm. You've never had that argument from me. Okay. We're, we were talking about, about the dynasty. Oh, okay. Okay, but to, so, me, but, but to me, Kobe is, 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 is always felt more real to me. And, and again, you know, for all the stuff he went through, he still died being married to the same woman and had four kids with her. That, that's a rarity yeah. in, in that league. It's a rarity. He made it work. So, and so you me, know how you know what's funny is because can, can I tell you a comparison that I was actually thinking on and I was actually going to write a piece on it? Okay is everyone talks about the greatness of all these individuals, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, comparing them to, to let's say, entrepreneurial individuals or, or when it comes to finance, the greats, right? You never say, hey, the greatest, you know, moneymaker ever is Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett or any of those things, right? Right, right. Everyone had their lane and they stayed in their lane and they were the greatest of what they did. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've gotten to the point where I'm kind of like over the goat talk, right? Yeah. I, the fact of the matter is, is the sickest human being athletically that ever walked on a court was by far Michael Jordan. 6'6", six, six, could jump out the gym, he could shoot, he was clutch, all those things. Now, the, the greatest specimen would be LeBron, mm-hmm. Right. LeBron is by far the greatest specimen ever on the court. And then Kobe, right? Kobe wasn't a specimen. He had to work to get his body. He was a skinny, scrawny kid coming out of school, right? Right. But he had the best fundamentals. Everyone talks about the big fundamental being Tim Duncan. Who had better fundamentals than Kobe Bryant? Really think about that. Well, considering what he played to, yeah. Data position, all of the different tools that he had he had he was the most fundamental player the nba i mean over over jordan jordan relied on his athleticism a lot now i'm not comparing that to taking impossible shots and making them. i'm talking about knowing the game being in position being on time not having to use extreme athleticism to become a champion in the league 
Right. That was Kobe Bryant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his you know, and and his perimeter game was very polished too. To, to, yes, you know he was he, he was the last player that had a mid range game. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, who are you going to put up there, Lou Williams or Jamal Crawford or someone like that? <laughs> you can't even put them in the same league. I'll say Melo's the only other guy I think had right? a great mid range game. That's about it. Melo was probably the last other guy I would say was in that. But he had nothing else. That's it. Yeah, but he was limited. Correct. Yeah, and you know, point. and everyone talks about Kobe not having the ability to pass the ball. His passing game was actually really good. Mm-hmm. He just didn't pass, <laughs> right? If if he's shooting forty six, forty seven percent from the field, and the team is shooting thirty three percent from the field, what are you going to do? You're going to shoot it, or you got to pass it? Did you prefer Those are the teams that, that Kobe had to deal with? Did you prefer number eight and twenty four? Because I'm a twenty four guy all day. 24 as a man. Mm-hmm. 24 as a man. Mm-hmm. Eight, I, I loved his uh, I loved his ability because 24 wasn't able to take over a game like eight could. I'm talking about a playoff game. I'm not talking about a regular season game. Right. Eight was able to take over a playoff game. 24 was more of a leader, timely, a fourth quarter assassin. That's who he was. Even though he had games where he was shooting, you know, was he eight or twenty-four when he had the eighty, or the what was he? I think he was eight at the time. Wait, which year? Whenever it was. Uh, that was oh six, right? Oh six, he was still eight. Right after the Phoenix so, series, uh, I mean, the next the year, twenty-four. That, right, and he became. I, I mean, look at the. We we talk about some of the greatest championship teams ever right we always mm-hmm. have that conversation the mount rushmore's of those teams yeah the team that you're never going to see on the mount rushmore was those two laker teams the kobe Paul gasol that group but you'll never get you're never going to see that on a mount rushmore. you know what's funny though you said that though but hmm. what's funny you said that because and this goes into the discussion we had on facebook uh over the weekend about about shaq's comments about Saying that his team, his three three peat team in the early two thousands would beat the Bulls last three teams in in a playoff series, you know, and obviously you and I butted heads on that topic. My buddy Mark Francois came on this mm-hmm. podcast Sunday, another Laker fan, lives in LA and all that. He said actually that he thinks while the Bulls will beat that early two thousands Lakers team, he thinks the team that would match up better with the the Bulls team in the late nineties is the last two that Kobe won with in o eight o nine ten. Um, because yeah, of, no, no comment on that one. He says, but, oh, he says because of more balance, say, but better balance. Respectful. But see that that's all relative, right? We which we we've talked about that era wide. Okay, mm-hmm. balance. The reason why he's saying the balance is because there was more shooters yeah. on the 2010 2011 team, and two bigs also too, right? right? That. Bynum and, and Gasol, right. But again, it still comes down to understanding the dynamic of what was happening. Bynum was a, was a strong center at the time before he became a head case, right? Right. He was athletic. He got up and down the court quickly. He was okay within the key, had a few post moves. Defensively, was a little bit of a liability. He was a rebound guy, but he wasn't a cover guy. He was slow getting on, you know, on, getting into the help, that sort of thing. And those shooters, yes, you're talking about a different era of shooters. Bujacic was, what did Phil Jackson say? He's, he was the greatest practice shooter he's ever seen in his life. Right? That was Phil right. Jackson that said that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, are, are you going to compare him to a Curry or a Clay Thompson or anything like that? No. No, of course not. Because he couldn't, he couldn't put the ball on the court. He wasn't, a, he wasn't that guy. But he was still shooting 45, 50% from three-point range for his three or four shots a game. If you did that same thing, remember, Mitch Richmond was on that squad. And they didn't use him. That's a good right? point. That's a good point. He was limited in his minutes. Mitch Richmond Rich- was on that squad. Derek Fisher was a 40% three-point shooter during those seasons. The triangle was not a three-point contest. Now, if you got into a pick-and-roll game, 
with a three point shooter. I mean, Robert Ory was still a 30, what, 38, 39% uh, three, three point shooter through all of that time. Mm-hmm. Rick Fox was a shooter. He could shoot from deep. That's all he did was stay at the three point line. You never saw him take it to the rack, but that wasn't the point of the triangle offense. So if you're looking at a triangle offense versus a triangle offense, because that's what it would be, you cannot sit here and tell me Shaq is not the biggest factor in that series. And not only am I going to tell you that they would win, they would win, the Lakers would win in six. Because if Hackashack was around and they start doing Hackashack, what do you think they're going to do to Dennis Rodman? Dennis Rodman was the worst free throw shooter than Shaq was. I get over that. I guess you can. What's that. good for one side is good for the other. You if that. you're going to slow down the game, and you're going to go into hack a shack, go into a hack a rod too. It's a good argument. It's a good. Rodman argument. was probably the worst free throw shooter we've seen that was actually an all star player. Mm-hmm. That could be argued. I mean, that's, that's a good argument okay. there. I, I think what the point I made about the Bulls is, and, and, and it also speaks to, you know. Why I said for years that Michael Jordan's last the reason why I've always been more impressed with Michael Jordan's first three title teams in ninety one, two and three, because that roster was less than. That ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight Bulls teams were stacked. It's a stacked roster. But it almost it almost wasn't fair who we had in that roster. People think that Ron Harper was an all star at one point. Or who was in the league at the time, yes. Yeah, Ron Harper was all star. The teams the that were in the league at the time, right. yes, that yeah. was unfair. Right. And again, it's a stacked roster. That's why, you know, you know, when Tony Kukoc, who just three years before that was considered the best player in the world, not named Michael Jordan, is now your sixth man, that's insane. Ron Harper, former All-Star. And then, you know, the Shaq thing, look, you're not going to stop Shaq and Kobe, you know, but they, the Bulls had the the assets, you know, that could make them work. In other words, the Bulls had 12 to 18 fouls to give um, to Shaq. You know what I'm saying? Between Luke Longley and Bill Wennington and, you know, Dennis Rodman and the, the third center they use once in a while, too. You know, and then you put Pippen on Kobe. Again, you're not stopping Kobe, but you can make him work. You know, my problem, my, 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 mm-hmm. argument, my argument with the Bulls is more so the supporting cast. I just think the supporting cast was a lot better than the Lakers. Whereas the Lakers were top heavy, in my opinion. Okay, so, so, go, down, so go down the lineup. Okay. We, we've gone over this a hundred times. Go down the lineup. <laughs> if I do a hundred more. <laughs> Ron Harper was on both teams, sir. I know, I know. But okay, but right? could we argue the who, Bulls or Harper's better than Who had the Harper? better point guard? Who had who they were they were within two years of each other. Well, I mean okay, well he's younger though. He's younger in Chicago. So Who had right. the hold on, who had who had the better point guard? Well, Fish is a starter, right? Fish is the starter. Yes. So Jordan so again, who had, who had the better point guard? Fisher Harper. I mean, ugh, I mean, I, I that's, okay. I, I do that a wash, maybe. Okay, Fisher. Fisher was a dynamite point guard. I'm not knocking. He me. knew how to run a court. He did. He Fisher did not turn over the ball. He always ran the play. But you can't tell me Ron Harper right? can't, can't. How many times did you see? How many times did you see Derek Fisher? Lose a game. Not often, but again, you can't tell me Ron Harper yeah. couldn't do do that assignment. That's not a, a not undoable assignment. Oh, we're just making it. We're we're going down the roster right. Okay. Now. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So just let let's go player for player as as a point guard. Okay. Derek Fisher is a long time consistent points and assist to turnover ratio juggernaut at point guard. The most comparable player to him that I remember in my days of watching basketball was DJ in Boston. Okay. Dennis Johnson. They were the same kind of player to me, right? They held the ball. They made sure that the play was being run correctly. They ran the court. They did not turn over the ball. And when they needed to make shots, they made shots. That's who Derek Fisher was. He showed consistency and success on every team that he went to. And clutch. Now let's go to the two. Jordan okay. Kobe, obviously. We can go Co- we can go Jordan Kobe. Well, in that kind of defensive scheme, it's never going to be one on one, right? It's always going to be help side defender, right? Right. right. Okay. 
So what does that come down to? How much help side defender do you really need when you have Shaq in the middle? So you're saying that Jordan Kobe could be a wash, I guess, or because who's so the what, what I'm telling you is it, 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 it would be a wash because, A, on the offensive side of the ball, Jordan would not be able to use as his athleticism to get to the rack the way he did, say, against the Lakers, the Suns, you know, the, those teams in those days. Because I'm, I'm comparing the early – the, the more athletic Jordan right now, okay? Because the more athletic Jordan was 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 the reason why they won. Mm-hmm. The reason why they won later on was more of the Kobe style Jordan when they won the second three feet, right? Right. He ran his team. He was more of a leader. He was vocal in practice. He was teaching defensive assignments, all of that kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're taking that later on, Jordan like 98, he wasn't that same athletic beast that he was before. It was, it was the MVP that year, too, that's on the record. Okay. The same. I, I mean, Charles he was Barkley still... was an MVP one year, too. No, 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 but again, you were saying late Jordan was still getting racket MVPs. Actually, I he think Carl still... Malone. Wasn't Carl Malone the MVP No, he's, he, and Malone won it the year before that. In okay. 97, yeah. But my point is, is, Athletically, he wasn't the same player. No, we can he became that. a little bit better shooter. He became a little bit better shooter. Defensively, he was more team oriented on defense. He would lock you down when he needed to. That's who Kobe Bryant was. Question is this: Who's going to get that assignment on Jordan on the Lakers? Devin George? On Jordan? Yeah, because ain't Kobe. Well, it depends in the in the fourth quarter. Well, most of the game. I mean, in the fourth quarter, it's going to be Kobe. Probably Kobe fourth quarter, but it, for the, the whole game, game. Though, it, it would probably be Devin George or whoever is a uh, uh, Rick Fox, whoever, because Devin George wasn't really a starter per se that year, right? He he came in to make stops. Robert Ory and Rick Fox were the two main people that were covering the twos and the threes on defense, right? And Rick Fox was. I mean, you remember how he was? He was chippy. He was physical. I mean, don't let the hair fool you. He was he was a tough cat. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. But what's about what's, what's Michael Jordan? I'm not talking about like some random like you know mid tier shooting guard. This is this is the criminal of the crime. Michael Jordan could handle that. Right. You're talking about a 27 percent three. You're, you're talking about a 27 percent three point shooter that had to come inside to the elbow in order to get a high percentage mid range jumper. If you have six, eight, six, nine guys that are covering you in there and you can't get past them because you have a seven, one, 300 and God knows how many pounds center, how, how well do you think that's going to work? Do you think he's going to be shooting over 50%? I mean, if you definitely make him work, I'm not going to no. deny that. It doesn't make him work. The answer is no. He would have to become a triple double guy. That would, that would be who he would have to become. You got and I don't, I don't, in my opinion, feel that outside of Kerr and Pippen, that you had people that could truly put the ball in the hole on the Bulls. The one, the one, the one X factor for the Bulls that they have. Kukoc was. Kukoc, yeah, that's, that's him. So the Kukoc was he's, streaking. But when he was on, he was on. I mean, Kukoc was streaking. He saved their season, Game Seven against Indiana that same year. Jordan had a horrible Game Game Seven against mm-hmm. Indiana, and Tony Kukoc went went ape shit pretty much. In that game. Yeah. And again, what was his strength? He was long and he could shoot from the outside. But the right? argument, the argument for the, same sort of thing. He was he, the argument for the late, late, the late 2000 Lakers though, is that while they probably didn't have, you know, obviously they have Shaq and Kobe was still more athletic in, in early decade, that roster, Lamar Odom and Bynum and Gasol and, and the shooters and all that. And in Kobe, to me, P. Kobe, I mean, we'll say P. Kobe is mid-2000s, you know, but with a worse team. But I I love 9 and 10 Kobe, right? Smartest player. One of smartest players, you know. And I think the roster gives it a chance against the 90s, 98 Bulls. Whereas, uh, you know, the 2000s, early 2000s Lakers team was very top-heavy, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. No, uh, absolutely. But, you know, again, in a championship series, you're really not going past – Seven players. I mean, let's be honest about. Well, Pat Riley does that crap. Um, as far as 
Right, well... <laughs> Pat Riley's known for that shit. Yeah, right? Yeah, I couldn't stand it. Like, I hate it. Use but, bodies. Um, but, but really, think about it. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a strong passion for that 2010-2011 Laker team. Like, I, I love every minute. What do you mean the 9-10 team? The one that won, right? The Celtics. The 9-10. Yeah, the 9-10. 10-11 was the yeah, one that won. 9-10. Right. 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 But uh, my, my point is, is, you know, just... I, the the Orlando series was boring. That really should have been Cleveland and LeBron. Um, you know, there there wasn't anything to that. But coming back from what they came against in Boston, doing what they did, and again, Derek Fisher being the leader that he is, was one of the main reasons they were able to. Uh, I, in, in my opinion, even though the games were close, Derek Fisher was really a huge asset because a he kept Rondo at bay. B, he made timely shots. And he was always running on the, running on the fast break every time they got a rebound. Right. Every single time. They didn't they didn't give the Celtics a chance to come back down and, and, and get in their defensive set. Again, experience, game plan, Derek Fisher ran that. Um, but the point of what I was trying to say about that, that Lakers team is, is they were very long. You had all those seven footers. Defensively, they were great. The fact of the matter is, though, you take those teams, anyone other than Fisher and Kobe, Lamar Odom, lost on every single team he was ever on. You as a Heat fan know that. Oh, yeah. Right? Bynum lost in space. Gasol has done diddly everywhere else. Memphis, he made it to the playoffs one time. Okay, Mm -hmm. you're talking about a lot of pieces that were just put together. They were not championship caliber players. They were brought together as a championship caliber team. They matched up well. Phil Jackson put it together. I'll even give a lot of credit to Mitch Kupchak for doing what he did. And I'm not a fan of Kupchak. You're not? He he put the players in the right. I'm not a fan. You know, I've never been a fan of Kupchak. I never, I never, I don't remember being that critical never of Kupchak, though. Oh wow! wow. You know, it's so, not. I wasn't necessarily critical. I'm just. I don't feel like he did anything special. Jerry West was special. Oh well, Jerry West is the greatest executive. He in the made of basketball. things happen. Right, and and what Kupchak came into was you had Shaq. Who was that done by? Uh, Jerry West, of course. It's quite fun. Jerry West, who drafted Kobe. Jerry West. Well, well, Jerry West didn't draft him, but trade for, trade for him. But yeah, well, you know, it was, it was the, the point was he made it happen. Right. No, you know, Russell right. discovered that. Of course, we're, we're agreeing on this. Yeah. Okay. So your generational dynasty was set up and put in place before you even came in. We could have been the general manager on that team. Hmm. So he, to me, he didn't do anything. He he screwed up a deal to get Chris Paul, which you know I'm still bitter about. That's not his fault though. That 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 was that's that's Dan Gilbert in Cleveland. Being, you can't being an tell you, you can't you can't tell me for a minute if that was Jerry West in that role or another notable general manager that it would not have been smoothed out with the NBA. You can't tell me that for a minute. I oh, don't know. Remember, that was, that was a lockout. The lockout was still going on at the time. It just, it just, it just ended. Um, so it was. It's okay. the time was particular. I get it. It's, it. It screwed up. I agree with you. I, I think it's got screwed in that in that deal. Believe me, I I, I, I agree with you. Mm-hmm. But it's just the, the 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 environment at that time was a little. <laughs> let's just say a little weird. Mm-hmm. So. So anyway, so that that's the point of what I'm saying is is my favorite is, as far as saying greatest center of all time, I would never say Shaq's the greatest center of all time because I'm you know I'm a Korean guy. He's supposed to be though. But let's, let's be real. He's supposed those, to be greatest center of all time. He's supposed to those, be. Well, he should have been, but he's not. But those three four years of Shaquille O'Neal mm-hmm. in L.A. Mm-hmm. You, you, I don't. You could put Michael Jordan and Wilt Chamberlain on the same team. I don't think they're doing anything with that. 
Well, I, I, I will say how I, dominant he. Oh was. yeah, I I I I've always defended that. I think Shaq in those three years, ninety nine, two thousand three, uh, Shaquille O'Neal was the most dominant force I've ever seen in that little th- four year bubble. Right. He, he had the greatest short term hiatus of anything we've ever seen. Right. Without question. Period. And there's not. I don't care if they came came in second place in the league that year, because they did came. They, they they were second. They were the second seed. And what's your idea? The fact of the matter is, right? Oh one, right? Yeah. What's that? Oh one. They were the second 0-1. seed. Yeah. Well, that was their that that was their best team. They were the second seed. They were injury riddled the whole season, mm-hmm. and they got to the playoffs and ran through the playoffs like butter. I'll say again. That, Against all 50 win teams. We don't talk all enough about teams. Kobe in that Western Conference Final against the Spurs. That was Kobe, dude. Of course. Kobe torched San Antonio Absolutely. in the series. Unbelievable. Absolutely. Probably his greatest series and of all I, time. And, and I, I remember him taking it to Duncan like he, that was his, you know what, I, I, you know, we're on air, so I'm going to keep it clean. You can curse he him took it to Duncan. <laughs> no, oh, my a, goodness. Yeah, he was that, – that, I, I, I'll say again, this, that, that, that is still Kobe's best series of his entire career, in my opinion. That went in against the Pacers. I, but I think he was so dominant. That went in against that, – That was for a moment. Right. That was the one time for a moment you forgot about Shaq. <laughs> if there's any time you said uh, Shaq's right. in the background, that San Antonio series but, was. But here's, a, here's a great example, though, right? Here's a great example. That Kobe Bryant that you saw right there mm-hmm. was Michael Jordan in the first three finals. That was Michael Jordan against Phoenix. But he Phoenix. had a Shaq. Yeah, against Phoenix in '93. Because <laughs> to, to me, I, I was making the argument. Oh, Phoenix '93, Lakers '91. I mean that that was who Kobe was on that series. I was told he still to, had his athleticism. Right. I was telling somebody a couple of days ago that if you want to see Michael Jordan's absolute peak of his powers, there's a three week gap you can pick out, and it's between Game Three of the night of the Eastern Conference Finals against the Knicks and the entire Phoenix Sun series in uh, in June of '93. Those three weeks. Oh, it's Michael Jordan's absolute peak. Those three weeks, down 0-2 against New York, then he dominates New York for four straight, and then dominates Phoenix for 40 points a game in the in the finals. That was Jordan's mm-hmm. absolute peak of his life, right there. Those those three weeks. Yeah, he was he was he was disgusting during that time. <laughs> Just disgusting. And, and and you and I were both the same. We were Jordan Jordan haters. Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was rooting for Knicks that series. I was, I, I'm a Heat fan. Rooting for the Knicks that series. Rooting for Phoenix that series. Broke my heart, dude. Right. Broke my heart, man. And and by the way, that Bulls team of the yeah. six championship teams, that's the worst one of the six. That was a two seed Chicago Bulls. Team. Probably so. Yeah, that was a two seed Bulls team. But um, again, who, who were the Suns? Who were the Suns? That Suns team, a, well, a, on paper I mean, anyway, they, they had were great. older Kevin Johnson. Well, on paper, they were they were the favorites. They, um, they, they, the, the Bulls were underdogs in both those series, though. You know that, right? The Bulls were underdogs at the Knicks and against Phoenix in both series. People forget that. All I'm saying is, is the, the I mean, we we always had this conversation. The league was so bad during that yeah. time. And, and, and Jordan, there was never there, there was never such a separation in and talent to, and as there be, was during right. that era. And to be fair, too. There were clues earlier in the playoffs that that team was maybe wasn't as good as he thought they were. This is this is in the era of five game series in the first round. AC Lakers took him to five. Okay, then he went to six in San Antonio yeah. in the second round, and then Seattle took him to seven games in the conference finals. So there were clues already that that Suns team mm-hmm. didn't been as good as we thought they were. And that Lakers team had nobody. James Worthy. They were completely injured. Sidney Three was a point guard at that point. And that, he was the best player on the team at that time. Yeah. And Sidel Three was a was a point guard. <laughs> that's a, that's a yeah. really bad Laker team. Well, not bad, but they were competitive. They were they, were, they had horses, but they weren't uh, uh, an elite team. That's post Magic, obviously. Um, but yeah, so you so, so you say right. if Shaq, so based on based on the Shaq uh, argument, you say Lakers in six, right? In six, okay, I, I got Bulls in six. All right, um, unless uh, unless they don't have home court, right? Then it's a different story because I mean Chicago Stadium was. Impossible. Well, they were in the United. Well, but at that time, the United what, Center though. But by, by, by that time, the United Center though. They, it it depends. 
No, we're, but we're, we're, we don't, again, we're not, it depends on what area you're talking about. That, that United, that, before United Center and Chicago Stadium, mm-hmm. Bulls didn't lose there. Oh, yes. But they, they, they moved out of Chicago Stadium. Well, even, uh, even at the United Center, they were pretty unbelievable, too. Well, yeah, they're pretty, yeah, Chicago Stadium definitely they never lost there, though. Absolutely. Um, okay, mm-hmm. last thing to let you go. Uh, a little football talk real quick. Uh, tomorrow's the draft. I don't, I, honestly, I, I feel so out of touch with the, with the draft. I'll probably find out everything else after after the fact. Um, but Rob Gronkowski, <laughs> out of retirement, and he gets traded to the Tampa Buccaneers. And this news took picked up like this, like like nothing. Like one hour, you would hear the news about him once he got out of retirement, and the next hour he's traded already. Right. Crazy, crazy stuff, man. Well, uh, I mean, as far as Gronk goes, it's a perfect situation for him to walk into because his biggest – issue was the amount of playing time that he had to have in, in New England, right? Because he was used as a blocker. He was used as a possession guy. And he was wore out by the time the season came. You know, he, he'd either get injured or he'd be wore out. Like, he, he even talked about how he could barely move during the Super Bowl, right? But look at the freaking receiving talent that Tom Brady has right now. It is so stacked. And now you have that that Jason Witten type tight end for Tom Brady. Gronkowski doesn't have to be great. Mike Evans is almost the same size as Gronk. And they got OJ Howard, who's the top top right? five assistant in the league. Right. But that that's what my point is. But I guarantee you, if you have those moments where you need a quick five, seven, eight yards, who do you think is gonna go to? Gronk. Because they know those they know those ISO receiving plays just like that like just out of feel right off the top, third down and seven, third down and six, every time, and it doesn't matter who you have covering because if you do end up doubling Gronk, you got everyone else. So I think that was a huge pickup for Tampa Bay. I think that's huge for Gronk and who he is and his legacy, and I think it's a dart in the eye to Bill Belichick. And it also adds to speculation about how Belichick handled that team the last couple of years um, and the egos and all that stuff. Um, we'll see how Belichick does about Brady next year. Um, they, they lost one as Brady, by the way. They lost a couple of players on, on defense. If Van Noy, I think, is gone, I believe, also, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but looking at Tampa in the short term next year, Brady's going to be decent next year. I don't think Brady will be, obviously, he'll, he'll, he's obviously 40 years old. He's not going to be the same guy. But with the weapons he has, he doesn't have to be great. Right. He'll be good enough. And he's smart. Um, and he's driven. Um, look at the NFC. This this Tampa team won 7-9 last year with the most inconsistent quarterback in the history of football in James Winston in one year, who led the league in touchdowns and interceptions. Mm-hmm. Okay? I was saying when, when they signed Brady, Brady could get to these two more wins, right? And now a Gronk? Another win or two, maybe? Right? I mean... This is a ten plus one team easily, right? In the NFC. Uh, well, I mean, it's a tough division. <laughs> but is it though? I really? Mean, is, I, but I but, but is it though? Is it really? I mean, look look down the. Uh, I mean, New yeah, Orleans would be okay, but I mean, Atlanta, man, eh, you know, you know they are. They 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 upgraded their running back. Okay. Gurley's going to make a difference, and you know, I was a huge Devontae Freeman fan. Oh, of course you were. But the fact was, injuries were getting. Injuries were getting to Devontae Freeman. Gurley has been controlled for the last year and a half. I think he's going to get probably two really good solid seasons before he starts falling off a little bit. But uh, I think he's trying to prove himself right now. He, he doesn't like the way he was traded in, in, in L.A. Let me ask you this, then, With the way things were going. With, let, let me ask you this quick, then. What's that? Is Tempe right now, on paper, the top six team in, in the NFC? In the NFC, yes. In the yeah. NFC, yes. Okay. So they'll play off team next year. This is their playoff team. Well, uh, let, let's be careful on that, right? Because the East is garbage. Of course. Right? It is. It's mm-hmm. still going to be garbage. Yep, of course. That's Philly's okay. losing. So next year. One, team, one team gets there by default. Okay? It's Philly. Now. You get into again Green Bay and Chicago is going to make a difference with with you know, who's at the helm now, a like quarterback. Nick, Nick Foles. I mean Foles, uh, uh, Foles. I think Foles may make a difference there. 
They have a very talented team, good mm-hmm. defense. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's say I, what I what I believe is that the NFC is going to be very top heavy. Okay, you're going to have a lot of 10, 11, 12 win teams. Yeah, like last which year, which makes it difficult for a team like Tampa Bay, New Orleans, Atlanta. Because Atlanta could run run the table if they if they could get a few things together, right? Matt Ryan break, gets it together. He has great receivers. You know you know how I feel about uh, the Atlanta receivers. Mm-hmm. I, I I personally feel that's the best receiving combo in the league. And that maybe that's me being a homer because of Calvin Ridley and well, I mean and, last I mean know, Julio Jones. Well, Calvin I mean last Ridley. year too was also a tail two seasons. They started off one and seven. And they're seven and nine. So again, they could be as streaky as anybody else in the league. I absolutely agree with you on that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So, and they and you know Matt Ryan when he when he has when Matt Ryan has the tools and a running back, he has the ability to win games. So don't and and we we called it, we had the same conversation I think even on air, the year that Atlanta went to the bowl. Mm-hmm. And, and we were saying that th- this is the type of team that he needs. He has Gurley now. I think they need one more running back along with Gurley because their O-line is above average. I won't say they're great, but they're above average. And you have great route runners and catchers when it comes to the Falcons. So I think they're, I think all three of those teams, New Orleans, Atlanta, Tampa Bay, they're going to be in that 10 to 11 win area, which means that there's going to be a tiebreaker for that playoff spot. Right. One of them is going to be the first, you know, the first team out. Well, I'll, I'll tell you right now, just on paper. Now, obviously you got months to break this down as you get closer to the season. I think you, you take, you get one team on the NFC East, which is Philadelphia. You're getting two in the, in the North, either Green Bay, Chicago, or Minnesota. A one of those combos, pick two of those. Are they going to get two out of, out of the and South? And don't they have the easiest schedule this year? Who's that, Tampa? Doesn't, doesn't, no, uh, Green Bay and Chicago. I'm not entirely sure. Division. I think they have the easiest schedule this year, right? I yeah, believe but, they but, do. But you know what, though, honestly, I don't I don't trust that anymore. You know why? Because teams that are bad one year are good the next year. It, it, teams turn around and get or get worse, you know, the year after. And this is why I think San Francisco will not mm-hmm. be in the playoffs next year. I think you take two in, in, in the South, um, two in the South, two in the North, and I think, because Russell Wilson's the goat, my, not the goat, but my guy. Um, Seattle wins the. Uh, he's the mo- he's the modern goat. Right, he's the West. He wins the West. So I think Tampa could win the, could could either win the South or win the wins a wild card. So so you're th- so you think two you, a wild card team is going to come out of the Central, is what you're saying? Well, the old Central, you're well, the North. A, a wild card team is going to come out of the South. South and the North. Well, yes. to me, it's still the Central. Yeah, uh, old school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Wild card, wild card on those. I, I, and I could agree single. with that. And single, single in the West and the East. Yeah. I I can't argue with that logic. I think San Fran took a it, step it, back. It's going to be a... – we'll see. Uh, you know, their defense, I think, is going to be depleted a little bit. Mm-hmm. Well, but we'll see what happens. I mean, they're, they're a well-coached team. Right. So, so but, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait for NFL – to, 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 you know, like any other sport, I guess, right? But well, I can't. I'm looking forward to the NFL getting started back up again. Are you just, I, I, to be honest, you dude, you're going to think I'm crazy. People think when I say that, they think I'm nuts. But I don't really miss sports right now. I'm not really missing it as much as I thought I would. And honestly, that has well, to, I, I think Kobe, I have a few I'll do that I too. Say to that, but we'll, we'll leave, we'll no, leave no, that no, for no, a no, but, but, but a lot of that, to be honest, you started up in January when Kobe died. So to be honest, that that was really rolling right. even before this thing happened. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I look. I, I I'm not saying I don't love sports. I just I just I'm not like oh my god, I miss basketball or football. I'm not in that realm. You know, obviously I, I would want it back. Obviously, but it's, right. I'm, I'm I'm not depressed about it. It's put that way. I'm watching The Office right now. I'm binging all my shows. I'm behind on. So. <laughs> So, so I got I got things, to, and, and that's helping all of your productivity. Well, and and again, I have I have enough distractions around me now. That's probably why, you know. So, right. Anyway, Frank, thanks for the pod. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Great job.